Welcome. It's great to be here this morning. There's something going on up here on the stage. It looks like there's a stage on the stage. Something good is going on. Music camp. We are ready for it. Let's go. One, two, three. Music camp. Yeah, we're excited about that. This morning, uh, it's been great to worship. And uh, man, uh, raise a hallelujah, girls. It's fantastic. Just thank you for singing to us, uh, Trinity and Maddie, it's great. We uh, are in a series called The Supporting Roles. This is the lessons we learn from the lesser known. It's about people who are really not the stars of each story. It's not about King David or Moses or Paul. Even though they play roles in the stories, we're kind of emphasizing uh, the lesser known people in those stories, and we're going to do that again today. Today, we're going to talk about uh, Philemon and Onesimus and Paul, but the three of them uh, play a role in the story and in a message that I believe God wants us to hear today. The uh, thing about these supporting roles, uh, they're people, and uh, they're real people, and so were the people that Paul wrote to. And in this case, he wrote a letter. Paul didn't write really books, you know. He wrote letters. And he wrote this letter, a personal letter, to a friend of his, Philemon. Uh, but there is this background that I want to give. And it's a background, not the story itself, but it's a theology that kind of supports and calls us to a, a certain way of life. And that's summed up really well, I think, in in Paul's writing of 2 Corinthians, and so I'll ask Mike to read these verses for us uh, today from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Okay, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 16 through 19. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting other people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. A couple of things from this reading. Number one, I love Mike's voice, so that's the way it goes. So sometimes I ask for it. We have a lot of good voices here, but uh, thank you, Mike, today. A couple of points from the reading. Number one, <clears throat> we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And I want to say that, can we really say that honestly? That's a big statement right there, that we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That we could embrace these words, I'm chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am. Amen? And yet, sometimes uh, we, we judge people, we view them from their socioeconomic status. Uh, we do it from, are they male or female? Are they black or white? In Paul's time, were they slaves or free men? And that'll be the kind of the focus of us today. Do they have an education? Uh, do they have any uh, talent? Do they have musical talent? Or do they have some athletic talent? What political party are they a part of? What nationality are a part of? Do we really view people from a worldly point of view quite often. And so I want to say this. This is Paul saying, that's not how we do it anymore. Because, he says, point two is, we are all a new creation. There was an old self. Now there's a new self as we've met Christ. There's an old Danny. And now there's a young Danny. Oh, no, no. Not young. New Danny. Because <laughs> even the new Danny's not necessarily young. Younger than Bob. Okay, get, in, get into this with me, folks. Okay, so there you go. Thank you, Steve. 
But we're new. We're new people. And a lot of what we were is not who we are. And so we view each other not from a worldly point of view, but as new people. And number three, that reconciling, part of reconciling means not counting people's sins against them. We don't do that. We're going to come to that a little later in this story, but we don't count people's sins against them. They've done that in the past, but they're now a new creation, and we don't view them like the world views them. And then number four, that he has given to us a mission, and he calls it the ministry of reconciliation. We've got a job, and it's to help the world reconcile to God and to each other. That's what our ministry is. He's appointed us as ministers. We're not the Secretary of State. We're not the Secretary of Defense. We're not the Secretary of Education. We are in the Ministry of Reconciliation. That's our job. And now that's what this story, the Philemon story, is about. So let's pray. God, today as we consider this short letter from Paul to Philemon, let us hear your message for us today. Thank you. Thank you that your spirit lives in us and we can read your word and find guidance for ourselves today. Hope for today and joy for today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the book of Philemon, there's some assumptions made as you read it and you kind of look through it. There's just a few verses uh, in it. It's tw 25 verses long and it's a, it's a letter from Paul to Philemon. And so I'm going to tell the story of Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul. So first of all, Paul is at Ephesus. Now when he's writing the letter, he's in prison at Rome. But he's in Ephesus, big city. I'm going to call it Dallas, okay? He's in the big city, and Epaphras, who lives, and we've talked about Epaphras a couple of times. Say Epaphras. Epaphras. Yeah, we remember him. He was, he was the guy that did what? He prayed. He wrestled in prayer. That was the guy. Well, he was from Colossae. And so Dallas is, is Ephesus, and we're going to say Weatherford is Colossae, okay? And so he's going from, uh, Epaphras is coming from Colossae. He hears about this Paul guy. He learns about Jesus. He becomes a follower. He's a Christian. And he goes back to Colossae, and he begins to teach the people in Colossae about, G about Jesus, and one of them, a guy named Philemon, he's in Colossae also. He goes and hears Paul also. And he comes back, and Philemon becomes the leader of the church in Colossae. Philemon is. The church meets at his house. So we know one thing, he has a big house with lots and lots of rooms. Thank you. There you go. Big yard, plays football. So... The church meets at Philemon's house. So he's, he's got a house big enough, and he's probably the leader of the church there. And then in our story, there is Onesimus. Now, when the story is happening, Paul has been take, gone to prison in Rome. And he goes to prison a couple of times in Rome. And the first time he's in prison in Rome, it's more like house arrest. And he has a, what I'm going to call a band of brothers who come to see him on a daily basis because the government didn't supply you food in those days, not even a place to work out, no education, like in our prisons today. But in their prison, they, he did have guys that could come visit him. Timothy was there, and Luke was there, and other people were there, and one of them who was there was Epaphras, and then this guy, Onesimus, shows up. And Onesimus becomes a Christian because Paul teaches him to be to follow Jesus. Paul's doing prison, doing missionary work while he's in prison. But Onesimus was different than the other guys because he was a runaway slave. He was a slave of Philemon. And so he comes to Rome, becomes a Christian. He meets, who, who do you think he meets there? Doesn't talk about this, probably Epaphras. Hey, yeah, we lived in the same town. Epaphras, I know Philemon, who, who was your master. Oh, I've heard you've run away from him. And as a matter of fact, the rumor has it that you've stolen some things from him and run away. And yet he becomes a Christian, 
And now Paul is there and he says, we got a problem here because this is a runaway slave from this guy. We've got to fix that. How, how what are they going to do? So what Paul does, he steps in, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, as ministers of reconciliation. Sometimes it's our role to step into a problem. He steps in and he sends Onesimus back to Philemon. But he asked Philemon to receive him, not as a former slave, not as a slave, but as a brother. Woo! That's a big ask. That's a big ask in that day. And so what I want to talk about, all three of these guys, Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon, and see if we can learn some things from them and also see ourselves in this story. Because I think you, you probably have some things in your life that are similar, that, that this story addresses. First of all, it's Onesimus. Uh, Onesimus is the one who has done the wrong thing. Now then, we're not going to get into a discussion about first century slavery, also the wrong thing. But, but in this story, Onesimus was the runaway slave who has stolen from his master. And Paul is going to send him back. And so to be obedient to this, to this teaching that Paul wants to make things right, he wants to reconcile, Paul's goal is to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus. And to do that, it's going to be a big risk on the part of Onesimus. Think about that. You're a slave, but now you've run away. The penalty for runaway slaves can be death. For sure, he's, asked, he's possibly going to be a slave again when he gets back. Now, it's going to take over a month to get from Rome to uh, Colossae. So Onesimus is traveling, and he's, do you think he thought, mm, I don't know if I'm going to go back. Were there days on that journey he thought, I think I might could find a place to live somewhere else besides Colossae. I don't know what, I don't know if, Philemon will take me back as a brother. I may be a slave again, or worse, I could get killed. This is all in his mind, but he's going to have to risk that. He's going to risk his life, really, trusting to be obedient, that, that he will no longer be a slave. I wonder if he could hear this. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. That's who I am. But wait a minute, I'm on this journey back to my former slave owner. What's going to happen to me? There's a lot of risk involved in reconciliation. If you're in, if you're in a broken relationship or if you know of people who are and your goal is in that relationship is to reconcile, there's risk. In this case, Onesimus had to say, I was wrong, here's your stuff. I was wrong, I'm back. And be willing to accept what Philemon does. So, there's obedience and there's risk. Now then, it's also obedience that leads Paul to risk his relationships so that he can be obedient. And so what's he, what's he got at risk? Well, his relationship. He's got a relationship with Philemon and he's asking Philemon to do something that Paul, Philemon could easily say, that's it for you, buddy. I don't need to take this slave back as a brother. The guy stole from me. He ran away from me. I don't, I don't need to do that. And for sure he's risking his relationship with Onesimus. Onesimus, who he says is like a son. This guy's like a son to me, but I'm going to trust you, Philemon, that you're going to take him in as a brother. He may not take him in as a brother. But there's a big risk on Paul's part that I'm going to send who has become a son back to me and he may end up dying. But Paul says reconciliation is worth the risk. It's worth the risk. Sometimes it's, it, it's for us to step in. So in, in, the, in the story, Paul inserts himself into... He could have easily said, well, it's none of my business. Have you, have you, do you have friends who, you know, they're having a tough time, they're broken in their relationship, and you want to say, well, that's none of my business. 
Well, maybe it is your business because you're a minister of reconciliation. Not a minister of judgment. Not a minister of condemnation. Not a, not a minister of, hey, do it my way or you're wrong, but a minister of reconciliation. Sometimes it's, it's right to assert yourself, to insert yourself. That's what Paul did. He says in the letter also about this stolen stuff. If there's a problem with that, he says, charge it to my account. Now, Paul's writing a letter that's pretty manipulative in a positive way. Because he, he, tells, he tells Philemon, man, you're the greatest guy ever, Philemon. By the way, you owe me your very life. So take, my, take this guy back. And, and if there's a financial problem, charge it to me. I'll pay for it. He puts his money where his mouth is. And sometimes it costs the person who's being the person who's the minister of reconciliation, it costs them time and emotional energy and sometimes financial as well. So Paul put his money where his mouth is. He also did this in the letter. He says, and by the way, Epaphras sends you greetings. Like, you know, Epaphras is in on this deal too. Epaphras knows about this letter. He knows what's getting ready to happen. He's your guy. He's the one who taught you about me, about Jesus. And then this, he says this, and I want to just read this from, from the book itself, from the letter itself, that the, the reconciliation, it's not just that Philemon is going to lose a slave. There's something he's going to gain. Listen to this. Paul says, I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I mean, you are it, man. Philemon, you're doing a great job. He says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith, with us, you know, <laughs> the band of brothers, including Epaphras, including Onesimus. I, I pray that your partnership with us may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. He says, you do this, do the right thing, Philemon, and your understanding will deepen. And isn't that true? When you have, uh, when you have experienced reconciliation with a person, your understanding of what we do for the sake of Christ deepens. Your experience causes your faith and your understanding to deepen. Sometimes you've got to step out there in faith and do the hard thing for your faith to kind of catch up, for your understanding for sure to catch up. And then there's also a risk on Philemon's point from his perspective. One is his reputation. I mean, you know, you're the guy who takes your slave back and who he robbed you. And, you know, you're also going to lose a slave and you're going to lose whatever he might have robbed, stolen from you. So Philemon has some things to, to wonder about, too. And, you know, sometimes when you're in the in a reconciliation situation. Uh, you've got to trust that the other person that you're reconciling with, that they're going to come up with, do their part of the thing also. You know, he's got to, he's got to, there's a lot of risk in this. Uh, I, let me just tell this story and see if you get this. My dad, I, I played football in Junction City, Kansas, and, and I was the quarterback of the football team my junior and senior year. And we had a, a lot of times, y'all may never have observed this, but sometimes people who are in the stands yell bad things at the players on their own team, you know, especially when they might make a bad play. And so uh, a lot of times the person who gets the brunt of the bad yelling is the quarterback, right? And so imagine you're my dad, and you're sitting in the stands on one delightful October day in 1971 and uh, in Junction City, Kansas. And the, there's a guy in the stands who is abusing his son, me. And here's what happens. Next thing you know, dad has had all he can take. And this guy's sitting three rows in front of him. Dad jumps over the people, tackles the guy, and 
begins to pummel him on the ground. This is, yeah, wait, this is my dad. And if he was here, he'd be sitting over here going, uh, yeah. And so right off the bat, uh, everybody knew this was not a good thing. And so the coach, and I, at that time, mom and dad were living in Abilene. Sally, they were living in Abilene. I was living in Junction City, Kansas. They'd come up to watch me play. And I was living at the coach's house. He was a great leader, mentor. So he kind of stepped in and said, look, you guys got to make this right. This isn't good, either one of you, especially you, Jerry. And uh, so <clears throat> they, they worked it out that the next week at the Booster Club meeting, they were both going to stand up and apologize. And so my dad gets up. He apologized, said, I did the wrong thing. That wasn't good, for, good of me. Uh, I'm sorry, and uh, that won't ever happen again. And then the other guy, he's supposed to get up and apologize, too. You know, he gets up and says, well, you're right. Uh, you owed me apology, and I accept it, and that's it. <laughs> but that's the way it is when you write. You have to risk it. I'm going to do the right thing whether or not the other person responds or not. You do it anyway. And Philemon, I'm going to take this slave back even if he doesn't. You know, even if I do get a bad name for it, I'm going to do it regardless of the consequences. And here, here's the point today. I'm going to ask you this, because I am Onesimus. I've been Onesimus. I've been Paul. I've been Philemon. I think you have too. Have you ever been in a situation where you did the wrong thing? You were the one who was in the wrong, in the broken relationship. I have been. Have you ever been the one whose friends are falling apart? They're in, in their job, in their profession, in their work. Or maybe it's, you know, you're working, or maybe it's in your marriage, or maybe it's a, a, a father and son, or it's a mother and daughter. But there's this conflict. There's this, and, and I've seen some of it work it out here in this church really well. Maybe you've been Paul, the one who had to step in and help things get back together. Or maybe you're Philemon. You're the one who has to forgive. And man, I don't want to forgive sometimes because I'm hurt bad. And, and for me, the couple of times where it's been the most hard for me is when uh, somebody hurt one of my kids. Because, you know, you can hurt me and I can get over it, but you hurt my kid, I'm going to kill you. You know, that's, that's my gut talking to me. For me, I, I can remember one time one of my best friends and the only friend I really knew from high school that I still know today, uh, he came and he came from, we were friends in Junction City, Kansas. His dad was in the Army too. He moved to Abilene, went to ACC with me. Uh, he was the first guy I'd ever baptized. We had a great relationship. My dad performed his wedding. And uh, just a great guy, still good friend of mine today. We don't see each other very often but we have a really tight connection. But there was a period of time early in his marriage where he decided he was out. And he walked away. He left. Uh, and I thought, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But I felt compelled to do something. And so I just said, Dennis, what are you doing? And we just talked about it. I didn't have any good advice. I didn't have any judgment. I just thought, this isn't the way you want to go, is it? And we just stayed in contact, though. We, we continued. I didn't cut him off. I thought, I said, I know you know this is not right. This is not a good thing you're doing. He, was, he knew it, too. But I wasn't going to, you know, cut him off, condemn him. So... As I stepped in, I stepped in that, that role where you're trying to help two people who are some ways, some, they've got something against each other. And you step in. I think this is our ministry. That we're people of peace. And we're people of reconciliation. In some way or another, we've all been Philemon. We've been Onesimus. And I'm telling you, it's our role at times to be Paul. Now, a lot of times you, you don't need to come in with advice because some of the things you deal with in, in terms of conflict 
it's over your head. And, and what you just need to be is a good listener and maybe be able to point somebody to some resources that can help. Because we know about that. We know, we know there's resources that can help. And so I'm suggesting that. But, but the thing I'm saying don't do this is just say, that's none of my business. Because if they're our brothers and our sisters, it's our business. It's family business. Not to rush in and be the, you know, the hero, but just to be the friend. Here's the thing, just the principle that I think I want to live, leave with us and live with today. And, and it's this idea that from, second, from 1 Corinthians 13, that love keeps no record of wrongs. Philemon could have gotten up every morning from the rest of his life saying, you know, my slave did me wrong. My slave stole from me. Even if he took him back, you know, he could walk around town and say, you know, this is Onesimus. He's the guy who stole from me. He's, he, he's the guy who, you can't trust him. He might run away from you. I've kind of forgiven him, but, you know, under duress, the duress of Paul. But love keeps no record of wrongs. We don't keep that scorebook. We don't pull out some things some person's done in the past and label them. That's who you are. Philemon and Onesimus had an opportunity for a new relationship. And that's what Paul helped them achieve. And I think that's who we're called to be. We're going to sing uh, How He Loves. And the line in this song, I really want you to just feel it in your life. He said, I don't have time to maintain these regrets. There's a lot of things we just didn't let go of. Because the blood of Jesus has washed it clean. It's washed away because God loves me and he loves us. And so the things that we've done and other people have done that are wrongs, let it go. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. God has forgiven you and he's forgiven me and therefore we forgive each other. We don't have time to maintain regrets when we focus on the love of Jesus. Let's sing, and then uh, I'll have another word at the end. Years later, a historian about uh, in the second century was writing about the first century church. And one of the things he wrote about was a leader. First it was John, and then it was Timothy, and then it was Onesimus, the leaders in the church in Ephesus. You never know what you do when you restore relationships that are broken for a moment, God can heal. God can heal them. And sometimes it's us to us to kind of take a step in, in helping that happen. One great step we're going to take next week, you know what it is? Amen. Yeah, well, we got to kind of set up. So after we finish today, uh, after I say amen, we're going to all help out in the way we can. Some of us need to help out by just stepping out the way. And then several others need to get together and move some chairs and some, do some other setting up of tables. Uh, it's been a great day to worship. Let's go and be an instrument of peace, amen, in our world today. Peace.